in this lesson, we're going to take a look at one-sided limits, a slight variation on the concept of a limit that we've been using up to this point. We'll start by looking at how to find one-sided limits graphically, and then we'll turn to analytical methods for finding them. Let's begin with some graphical examples. When we're dealing with one-sided limits, the concept of direction comes into play. And of course, we're doing calculus, so we're talking about change. And when we're studying how something is changing, at least sometimes the direction of the change is important. An example would be a change in an object's position. Sometimes it matters whether the object moves to the left or to the right. Now, when we're studying limits, we're looking at a kind of change. We're looking at what happens to the value of a function as we bring the input to it or its independent variable value closer and closer to some number. And in at least some cases, the result of this or the effect that this has on the function values depends on the direction in which we're changing the independent variable. This is where one-sided limits become relevant. Here's an example. Let's start with a piecewise defined function. You can see a definition here of a function f. f is equal to f of x is equal to negative x plus one when x is less than one and is constantly one as long as x is greater than or equal to one. Now, here's the question. What is the limit as x approaches one of f of x? Well, let's approach this graphically. We'll do this by taking a look at the graph of the function. And it looks like this here. You can see that to the left of where x equals 1, we've got a line that looks just like y equals negative x plus 1. And then when we get to where x equals 1, the graph jumps up to the point 1, 1 and stays where y equals 1 off to the right. And notice that as we move closer and closer to where x equals 1 along the graph, the y coordinate we're getting closer to depends on the direction in which we're moving. If we're moving from the left, we're getting closer to zero. But if we're moving from the right, we're getting closer to one. So that brings us to the idea of one-sided limits. Right? This will allow us to talk about situations like we just saw, where the limit value might depend on our direction of approach. So there's the graph of our function once more. What we'll say here is that if x approaches 1 from the left, in other words, if we approach the point where x equals 1 by starting from the left of that point and moving to the right, we see that our function values are approaching 0. So we can short that or shorten that by saying that the limit from the left as x approaches 1 is 0. On the other hand, if we're approaching one from the right, that is if we start to the right of where x equals one and work our way to the left, then we see that our function values are approaching one. In fact, they're constantly one. So we'll say that the limit from the right here as x approaches one is one. So that's the idea behind the one-sided limit. Let's introduce some notation building on our familiar limit notation to talk about these. It, this just involves a slight modification of our ordinary symbol for a limit. So here's what we found about our piecewise function that we just looked at, the one we called f of x. We said that the limit of the function as x approaches 1 from the left is 0. Here's how we'll write that using our limit notation. We got the limit abbreviation, x arrow 1 like usual, x approaches 1. But now we put a little superscript minus sign to indicate that x is approaching 1 from the left, from the negative direction, so to speak. And then the rest is all the same as the ordinary limit notation we already know. And to say that the limit of f of x as x approaches 1 from the right is 1, we'll use a very similar sort of symbol. But now we'll put a superscript plus sign in place of the superscript minus sign. That's our indication that we're approaching 1 from the right. So you can think of the minus or plus superscripts here as telling you where you start your approach. If you start from the left, that is from the negative side, you put a minus sign there. If you start from the right, you put a plus sign. Now let's contrast our earlier example with that piecewise defined function with a polynomial function. Let's look at the graph of the function g of x defined by x squared plus one. So here's the graph familiar sort of parabola. 
And let's say we ask what the limit is as X approaches zero from the left. So we're gonna look to the left of, our, of where X equals zero on our graph, work our way to the right and see what happens to our Y coordinates as X gets closer and closer to zero. And we will be approaching the point where Y equals one. So the value of that limit is one. We can ask the same thing, but from the opposite direction, what's the limit as X approaches zero from the right? Well, it's also gonna be one, because if we start to the right of where X equals zero and work our way to the left along the graph, we'll be getting closer and closer to where Y equals one as X gets closer and closer to zero. So in these two cases, the limits, the one-sided limits agree with each other. They give us the same value. And that also happens to be the ordinary non-one-sided limit. Uh, value, that ordinary limit is also equal to one. So that introduces a kind of relationship between one-sided limits and the more ordinary limits that we've been looking at up to this point. So in our example a moment ago with that parabola, the one-sided limits from both directions were equal, and they were equal to the value of the ordinary limit, or what's sometimes called the two-sided limit. And that will happen every time. Any time the one-sided limits for a particular function agree with each other as you approach some particular number, the ordinary limit will be the same and everything will be equal. In other words, if the limit as X approaches A from the left of a function is equal to the limit as X approaches A from the right of the same function, let's say those are both equal to L, then the ordinary limit as X approaches A will also be equal to L. And we can flip this around as well. The converse is always true. If the ordinary limit is equal to L, then both of the one-sided limits are, are guaranteed to be. We don't need to investigate them separately. So that's how we can deal with one-sided limits graphically. Let's take a look at how we can deal with them analytically. These usually come up, and at least they usually come up in settings where the one-sided limits are, are really critical when you're dealing with piecewise defined functions. Think of our first example again. So what will end up happening is that you'll often get a disagreement in the value of the one-sided limits from the left and from the right at the places where the function switches to a different piece, where it changes its behavior. And usually the easiest way to deal with that is to look at the graph of the function. So this is a case where graphical methods tend to be a little more useful. But sometimes you can work with these purely analytically. So let's take a look at how to do that. Here's an example. Let's say we have this piecewise defined function. And we're going to find the one-sided limits as X approaches negative one from the left and from the right. So let's start with the limit as X approaches negative one from the left. If we're approaching negative one from the left, then all of the X values we're passing through are less than negative one, because that's where the numbers to the left of negative one are. That's what numbers appear to the left of negative one. And as long as X is less than negative one, our function behaves exactly like X squared plus three X minus two. That's what our function definition tells us. So these two limits will be equal. The one-sided limit as X approaches negative one from the left of our function F will be equal to the ordinary limit as X approaches negative one of the piece of F that defines that chunk x squared plus 3x minus 2. That's a limit we can find by substitution. And when we calculate it using substitution, we get negative 4. So that's the value of the limit as x approaches negative 1 from the left of this function f. Let's take a look at the limit as x approaches neg uh, excuse me, negative 1 from the right of the same function. Well, here we're only going to consider values of x that are greater than negative 1 because we're to the right of negative 1. And as long as x is greater than negative 1, our function behaves exactly like 2x minus 5. So in the same way as before, these two limits are going to be equal. We can look at the ordinary limit in this case as x approaches negative 1 of 2x minus 5. That's also a limit we can find by substitution, 
And when we calculate the value of the limit, we get negative seven. So that gives us the second limit that we were trying to find. The limit as x approaches negative one to the right of this function is negative seven. Now, notice that these disagree with each other. So one thing you might ask is, well, what's the value of the ordinary limit? Is it negative four? Is it negative seven? Is it something else? Well, in this case, it does not exist. The, the ordinary two-sided limit as x approaches negative one here is undefined. And that's because the two one-sided limits are not equal to each other. So that will happen in general. Anytime one-sided limits as you approach the same number disagree with each other, the two-sided limit or the ordinary limit does not exist. 